Street Week with Louis Rukeyser. Brought to you by public television stations. By Hanson Trust, a $10 billion transatlantic company with 23 consecutive years of growth in earnings and dividends by providing essential goods and services. By Prudential Bates Securities, the investment firm with rock solid resources that's leading the way to the future for investors. And by Primerica the new name in financial services and specialty retailing, a company with the resources to fund growth for tomorrow, Primerica, a name to remember. Produced Friday, October 23. Tonight's special guests are Stephen G. Einhorn, co-chairman, Investment Policy Committee, Goldman Sachs & Company, William A. Schreier, chairman of the board and chief executive officer, Merrill Lynch and Company, Incorporated, and John M. Templeton, founder and principal, the Templeton Funds. Good evening, I'm Louis Rukeyser. This is Wall Street Week. Welcome back. Okay, let's start with what's really important tonight. It's just your money, not your life. Everybody who really loved you a week ago still loves you tonight, and that's a heck of a lot more important than the numbers on a brokerage statement. The robins will sing, the crocuses will bloom, babies will gurgle, and puppies will curl up in your lap and drift happily to sleep, even when the stock market goes temporarily insane. And now that that's all fully in perspective, let me say, ouch, and eek, and medic. Tonight, we're going to try to make sense out of mass hysteria to look behind the crash of 87. And most perilous, but most important of all, to look ahead. In that effort, our program tonight will be a special one, in keeping with a week that was in many ways the most unusual in all the millennia of investing. Our regularly scheduled program on food stocks has been postponed till December. Instead, tonight, we'll try to give you food for thought about Wall Street's record case of indigestion. In place of our usual format, I'll be talking with three genuine titans of investing. The boss of America's largest brokerage firm, the greatest mutual fund manager of the past generation, and a portfolio strategist whose investment decisions move billions. Meanwhile, let's keep the windows sealed and our hearts calm. For in the immortal words quoted by Adlai Stevenson, I'm too old to cry, but it hurts too much to laugh. It seems as if everyone in America with access to a microphone has been telling us this week with stunning hindsight precisely why the Dow Jones Industrials took a record 508 point, 22.6% nosedive Monday. We heard about rising interest rates. We heard about the trade deficit. We heard about the budget problem. We heard about leadership worries. And if we're to believe last night's presidential news conference, most of my colleagues in the Washington press corps appear to be convinced that the root of the problem is that we just haven't raised taxes enough. All fascinating theories to be sure, but the difficulty is that none of these problems was born at 9.30 Eastern time Monday morning. Indeed, the only major external developments over the weekend were the U.S. attack in the Persian Gulf and Treasury Secretary Jim Baker, with his inimitable sense of timing, starting a brief public feud with the monetary authorities in West Germany. He was, of course, joined in financial expertise by the wizards of ways and means, who seemed to think this was a splendid time to be hitting the markets with new anti-takeover taxes. Time alone will tell whether Black Monday enters the history book as the day American confidence was so shaken that a premature recession resulted, or merely as the day the computers went wild and through the wonders of so-called program trading, turned a normal correction into an early Halloween. But we'll try to give you some early hints tonight. First, though, let's strengthen our nerves, 
remember those puppies, and look at the numbers. And as the Dow Jones Industrial Average indicates, there's never been another week like it, which is okay by me. With record rises following but not matching the record decline, and with trading volume more than twice last week's previous record, the Dow could not be saved even by falling long and short-term interest rates and closed with a loss just shy of 300 points at 1950.76. And there were similar disasters throughout the broader market indexes, all of which are back to levels last seen in 1986. But looky here, a good record for the week for a happy change. Our elves have moved their technical market index all the way from minus one to plus six. Not only their first outright buy signal in nearly three and a half years, but by far the biggest one-week change they've ever reported. While the elves have sometimes been early, their long-term record has been superb. Let's hope they've got a bullseye tonight. But there haven't been many other places to hide, with precious metals, interestingly, almost unchanged for the week. Now, before we look ahead with our star panel of special guests, let's quickly seek perspective by seeing what has happened in the past, a pattern of ever-shortening recoveries after the fall. The Dow Jones Industrial Average had reached the highest point in its history, 381.17, September 3, 1929, before plunging in November to 198.69, losing more than half its value. It took a quarter century for that damage to be entirely repaired and the Dow to get back to its pre-crash number. Within those years of trying to catch up, the market had a post-war tumble in 1946 when the Dow fell 20% in less than two months. It took till 1950 to make up that loss. More recently, though, the Dow dived in 1962 from an all-time high of 723.53 in March to 535.75 in June, a 26% bash, but all that was regained within a year. Will the age of compression move even faster this time? From its all-time high of 2722.42 this past August 25th, the Dow was down 36% at, at Monday's sickening close. Since then, it's gained 12%. As we wait to find out whether we've now seen the lows and how long the recovery will take this time, let's seek further perspective by looking at a chart that indicates the jury is still out on whether the great bull of the 1980s is indeed dead, as most commentators seem to assume this week, or merely deeply gored. This is the trail of the bull that was born in August 1982 and marched with not even as much as a 10% stumble after 1984 to a gain of more than 250% by this past August. At Monday's dismal close, the Dow still held almost exactly half its bull market gain. And since then, the market has moved up. Tonight, in fact, the Dow is actually higher than it was on the first trading day of 1987, and higher, in fact, than on every single day but one in its entire history before 1987. Small consolation, to be sure, for those whose pocketbooks were severely wounded this week, but useful in distilling the headline hysteria. To help further, we have three of Wall Street's giants with us tonight. Bill Schreier is chairman and chief executive officer of America's biggest brokerage firm, Merrill Lynch. And he's also vice chairman of the New York Stock Exchange. Steve Einhorn is co-chairman of the Investment Policy Committee at Goldman Sachs. And John Templeton, founder of the Templeton Funds, has over the last generation compiled what is quite simply the best public long-term investment record <coughs> in the business. Gentlemen, let's begin by asking each of you, What's the single most important lesson of this week's debacle in Wall Street, Bill? Well, Lewis, uh, I think probably if I could sum it up in two words, I'd say uh, don't panic. Whether you be uh, an individual investor, an institutional investor, or one of the professionals that are, that are, that, where they're working in our business. So in two words, don't panic. S Steve, what would your words be? I think there are two elements um, that combine to bring about the most important lesson of the week. The first one is that there is uh, uh, a tolerance that the market has for inadvisable economic policies, but that tolerance is not indefinite. 
and the economic policy that they found intolerable was the large budget deficit. The second important lesson, I think, and critical, is that the world uh, or industrial countries must cooperate with each other in terms of economic policy. Confrontation is simply unacceptable in the conduct of economic policy. Cooperation is critical. John? 